to a history class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of 1968. In the last few lectures, we've been talking about a variety of social movements that swept across the country during the late 1960s. In this final lecture in this series, I'll talk about one of the most obvious and pervasive movements sweeping the country in 1968, the hippie movement. Of all the movements of the late 1960s, perhaps the one most identified with that era was the hippie movement. The hippie movement evolved from the beatniks, or the beat generation, of the 1950s, which I discussed briefly in one of the introductory lectures of this course. The beats represented a counterculture in the 1950s, exemplified by beat poets like Allen Ginsberg, who rejected capitalism, consumption, war, government, and many other fixtures of mainstream culture in the 1950s. The Beats preached individual freedom and endorsed travel and movement, freedom of belief and expression, and communing with nature. The hippies of the 1960s built upon that foundation, but the movement became much wider spread as the baby boom generation grew into young adulthood by the mid-1960s. While there were always hippies of some kind, the national media began to identify a bona fide movement by 1965, originating in the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco, and spreading from there to other parts of the country. The hippies incorporated many of the groups I've described in other parts of this lecture and the course, and many young people in America embraced at least some of their beliefs and methods. Others went all in, living in hippie communes and abandoning, for a time, traditional modes of work and lifestyles. The hippie movement truly flowered in 1967, a time known as the Summer of Love. One spark was an enormous gathering called the Human Bee Inn, a peace gathering in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park in January 1967, organized by the artist Michael Brown. 20 to 30,000 people gathered, listened to music with shared food and other substances. For those in attendance, it was a beautiful, inspiring experience. In March of 1967, a similar gathering was held in New York, the Central Park Be In. And in July of 67, the hippies flocked to San Francisco again for the Monterey Pop Festival, a signature moment in the Summer of Love. The festival, a precursor to Woodstock, which was held two years later, featured bands like the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin, all of whom embraced hedonism, drug use, and preached the hippie lifestyle. The Grateful Dead and several others of these groups actually lived in a commune in Haight-Ashbury for a time. That summer, Scott McKenzie's song, San Francisco, was a huge hit, including the line, if you're going to San Francisco, make sure to wear flowers in your hair. And thousands of people did flock to San Francisco with flowers in their hair, leading to the nickname Flower Children. Hippies came to be connected with a certain sound in 1968, and a number of bands were of particular appeal. In addition to the bands I just mentioned, hippies were drawn to Simon and Garfunkel, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Neil Young, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Joni Mitchell, and Bob Dylan and the band. I'll discuss the music of 1968 and many of these groups in much more detail in a future lecture. The hippie movement was featured in Time magazine in its July 7, 1967 issue, which in part described the movement this way. Do your own thing, wherever you have to do it and whenever you want. Drop out. Leave society as you have known it. Leave it utterly. Blow the mind of every straight person you can reach. Turn them on, if not to drugs, then to beauty, love, honest, fun. There was much positive in the hippie movement, notably its focus on peace and love as opposed to violence and war. In San Francisco, the hippies also became associated with the Diggers, a group of actors from San Francisco, including Abby Hoffman. They were based on a 17th century English free land movement that preached the end of money and property. They established a grocery store in the Haight-Ashbury district 
that gave out food to anyone in need. Hippie clothing and dress has become closely linked to how we remember the 1960s today. Hippies typically wore long hair, flowered or tie-dyed clothing, bell-bottom blue jeans, headbands, and beads. Hippie men often had long hair and beards and generally seemed unkempt. Women sometimes wore long, loose-fitting dresses in tie-dyed or other brightly colored patterns. Accessories included beads, belts, vests, sandals, flowers, headbands, pins, and knitted or crocheted bags and backpacks to carry their belongings. The appearance of the hippies created much backlash among older and more conservative Americans. Ronald Reagan famously once described a hippie as, quote, someone who dresses like Tarzan, has hair like Jane, and smells like Cheetah. Too much of the kind of things that the hippies embraced sometimes created problems. Free love became hedonistic and led many impressionable young people into unexpected excesses of unprotected sex, unwanted pregnancy, or worse. Similarly, while small samplings of mind-opening drugs in a safe environment were thought to contribute to incredible bursts of creativity, like the Beatles' music, the creation of home computers, and many other developments, all too many hippies overdosed on drugs, or became addicted and strung out. A bit of freedom and communing with nature is good for anyone, but abandoning education, family, jobs, and income led many hippies to poverty and homelessness. The mantra of sex, drugs, and rock and roll conjures up images of a fun, freewheeling, peaceful, and creative era. And much of that is true. However, the excesses of the hippie movement led many young people of 1968 down paths that led to despair and poverty. In some cases, the fun and excitement of leaving home and rejecting traditional societal norms led to aimless wandering or susceptibility to succumb to more dangerous practices. Like so many other elements discussed in this course, this divided legacy of the hippies is representative of the yin and yang that was 1968. In our final lectures of this course, we'll examine how these trends played out in the popular culture of 1968, in books, movies, and music.